Uh, please help me welcome uh, David Poole back to the board. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? But not well enough, I hope. All right, good. Um, man, thank you, David, so much. Uh, you know, you made me nervous when everybody stood up earlier because I'm a lawyer, and usually when people stand up, it means the judge has just walked into the room, and, and initially I, I got very nervous. That's just a natural reaction, but, but I'm a recovering lawyer and now a corporate executive, and that's much less boring and much more exciting, I hope. Uh, so we're going to talk a little, bit about, a little bit about that today. But first and foremost, thank you. Uh, for, for bringing me here. Thank you, David, for the invitation. This is really, really cool, I think, for you guys to hear my perspective and then just as important for me to hear from you. So hopefully I can get done with this affirmative presentation relatively quickly and then we can just talk. Uh, happy to talk about Boeing, happy to talk about sort of life as a corporate executive, um, frequent flyer miles, you know, all the glamour, <laughs> uh, or, or whatever you want to talk about. Um, you know, your campus is so beautiful, and it's such a treat uh, to be here. And, and I understand this is a new facility, uh, so it's a, a special honor uh, to be here. If I had one small quibble, I, I was walking through the halls, and um, I saw a, a flyer from the Vegan Club, which was announcing a film called The End of Meat. And, and I thought, gosh, the fact that there is a vegan club and the fact that meat could go away sounded very tragic to me. But, uh, but, but uh, with, with that one caveat, uh, it is an absolute thrill uh, to be here uh, uh, with you all. Uh, you know, Boeing has already a great relationship with the college. Um, you know, we've got 80 of your alumni right now working for us. And, and linger on that number for just a second. 80. That's 80 families, 80 households, 80 of your graduates who are right up the road doing uh, various different things uh, for us. And is the mic going in and out? Or are we doing OK? OK, all right, cool. So um, including, uh, on a personal note, my mentee, uh, who is a guy named Tyler Edwards. He's a graduate of this school, and he's one of our finance whizzes uh, up at Boeing, South Carolina. Very good guy. Uh, and then also, our general counsel had the privilege of, uh, of speaking at your commencement just two years ago now, I think. And when you're a lawyer in the Boeing company and, and, and your general counsel is, is speaking, you pay very close attention. So that was a fantastic speech, I can assure you. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to talk about today is, is Boeing South Carolina and the two questions that can drive innovation. Really cool topic, right? And, and, and it's a cool topic not just because it tells you about companies, uh, but it can also tell you about yourself, okay? And, and I hope that during this presentation, you guys can learn a little bit about Boeing, but most people know the story already. But you can also learn a little bit about yourself uh, because I want you guys to ask yourselves these questions for you. Okay, they are very relevant to, uh, to, to companies. Uh, they are very relevant to nonprofits and other organizations that you will someday be a part of, but they're also relevant to you personally, okay? Now, yesterday I heard this great speech from a neuroscientist. He spoke to the uh, Charleston Regional Development Alliance, a group of folks who get together and try to recruit big companies uh, to come here. And, and he, he gave this fact based on the research. He said, if you learn something, and hopefully you'll learn something today, not I've failed. If you learn something and you then take 45 seconds after learning that something, 45 seconds to think about it before you return to your phones, 45 seconds, that's all it takes for it to sink in and to bend your brain a little bit. So my ask of you today is try to pay attention as best you can, but, but regardless, afterwards, take 45 seconds to think about these two questions, all right? and then get back to Instagram or whatever. Okay, cool? Great. So, when you think of Boeing, you think of airplanes, right? Airplanes that you all have flown on, airplanes that we build nine miles up the road. Uh, this is what everybody thinks about when they think of Boeing. My wife thinks about a paycheck, but most people think about airplanes, right? So, what you may not think about are the other innovative things that Boeing does, all right? So definitely, the 787 is our showpiece airplane right now. It is the most innovative thing that we build sort of on a large scale. But check out what else we build. All of these are made by Boeing, okay? Whoop. The, the uh, TX trainer, Boeing was just awarded a multi-billion dollar contract, and every uh, pilot that comes through our military will be trained on that trainer. Pretty cool, right? Kind of a bummer for South Carolina because Lockheed was competing against them, the L word. And they had uh, promised to build their plane if they won up in Greenville, but they didn't win. Sorry for Greenville, great for Boeing. TX Trainer, look at that, that's pretty cool. 
the Apache helicopter, which we make in Mesa, Arizona. Imagine staring down you know, the front end, the business side of that one. There's the F-18, which we make in St. Louis. This is the V-22 Osprey, which we make up in Philadelphia. And, and just to put a fine point on it, those, you know, those rotors, as you know, tilt that way and fly the thing forward, right? And then it can land vertically. Pretty cool, right? Very innovative. This is the MQ-25. That is a big, nasty drone, OK? And I swear it is a drone. I asked the team, if it's a drone, which means a pilotless aircraft, why is there a little slit on the top there for, for, uh, for, for are we trying to sneak a pilot in without people knowing it? They swear it's a drone. Well, anyway, we just want a big competition uh, with the military to, to deliver those, and we're building them in St. Louis. Pretty cool. Everybody recognizes this, right? The most productive airplane uh, in, uh, in the United States. And, and this was the subject of one of the president's first tweets, where he, he declared, Air Force One, too expensive, cancel program. <laughs> so, well, with capital letters. <laughs> it's a very bad day in the Boeing company. And, but we've since turned it around with the president. And, and of course, we're, you know, we're, we're delivering uh, a 747 modified heavily uh, for his uses. Uh, so that's a cool program. Satellites, which we build in Southern California. This is neat, right? Two years ago, we uh, uh, acquired a company called Liquid Robotics, which is based in Sunnyvale, California. Name the most famous company in Sunnyvale, California. Name the most famous company in Sunnyvale, California. No, 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 not Lockheed. Gosh, that'd be terrible. Who else? <laughs> not Boeing. Yahoo, Yahoo. Soon to be extinct, right? But had a great run. So we acquired uh, Liquid Robotics. And what they make are, um, the, if you look at the top of that picture, um, it's, it's sort of a glorified surfboard or a big kayak. And underneath that is sort of a, 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 an airplane looking thing. So those are sensors on each side of that airplane that beam up to satellites up in space so that you can communicate from the bottom of the sea up to space, right, and cover all of those columns, right? Pretty neat. When we acquired that company about two years ago, I did the due diligence on it. And I wondered, why in the world are we acquiring a kayak company? And they said, well, the kayaks sell for $250,000 a piece. I said, great, <laughs> kayak company it is. Um, more drones, right? These are uh, the, the Scan Eagle made by Boeing's subsidiary in situ, I-N-S-I-T-U, right, which is based south of Seattle. Um, these can be launched, obviously, off of a desolate uh, running way like that or also off of a Navy ship. And the cool thing about this picture is, you know, you always wonder when, you, when you're flying drones, it's simple to fly it. What's the hardest part about a drone? The landing, right? <laughs> well, guess how we land one of these things? It's spectacularly complicated, and if you can't follow it, that's fine. I understand that. It's, it's, you know, it's only the lawyers can understand it, right? Here's how you land a scan eagle. Well, you have a hook <laughs> on the side of, of, of the wing, right? And you see that sort of crane-looking thing? Well, it's hard to see from the picture, but there's actually a clothesline hanging down from that crane. Again, this is very advanced. Stop me if you need clarification. But the way you land a scan eagle drone is you fly it in and you literally run the, the, the wing into that uh, uh, clothesline and it, whoo, it whizzes around and lands, right? Very advanced. I can see you're just enthralled by that, right? Scan Eagle. Uh, and finally, uh, the Starliner space capsule. So that capsule is going to be um, the, the mechanism that we send uh, Americans to space on a U.S.-made ship for the first time in, I don't know, a decade or something like that, right? So that capsule will be placed on top of an Atlas rocket and fired up into space. That is a very cool thing. So, look, Boeing makes some cool stuff in addition to just commercial airplanes. But, but think about where we've come since the beginning of flight, right? Think about where we've come to get to a space capsule that we launch into space, right? Anybody know who were the two guys that started, you know, had the first airplane, first flight? The Wright brothers, first names. Orville and Wilbur, those poor guys, right? Orville and Wilbur Wright. So in 1903, right, they stood at the Outer Banks, just a couple of hours north of here, and, and they stood and they watched the wind, and they watched the seagulls, and they tried to figure out how do we fly. So they put together this contraption that we've all seen, right? And they had the wind behind them, right? Because that made sense. You needed to get you know, a tailwind so that you could take off. And they whizzed down the beach, and nothing happened. They didn't fly. So they, they regrouped and you know, 
shrugged their shoulders a little bit, and, and, they, and they went back to watching the seagulls again. And they said, what do they know that we don't? So the seagulls, right, have you ever, ever, ever watched those on our beaches when they sort of face into the wind, right, and they can kind of hover there without flapping, right? So that was the grand innovation of the White, Wright brothers, is they realized we shouldn't have the wind behind us. We need to turn this contraption around and face the wind, right? And then they took off. What a cool thing. And then Orville Wright has this great line. One of them got really badly hurt, by the way, in one of the uh, early uh, test flights. But, but they had a great, um, they had a great uh, sort of summation of their life. They said, no bird soars in a calm. They had a very tumultuous life, a lot of patent litigation, uh, very difficult. But they summed it all up by saying, no bird soars in a calm. Right? They face the wind, and that's how they soar. And that's what you all should do. So I want to play this video, and the reason is, from 1903 to 1963, right, we went from not being able to fly at all to be observing, you know, birds and that sort of thing to, sh you know, shooting people off to the moon, right, in only 60 years. That's a very short period of time for that innovation to occur. So I want to show you this video to kind of illustrate how fast and how far uh, we came. All right. It's about three minutes. I don't know about the sound. There's no sound. He won next door. <laughs> oh man, this is the magical one too. You facing into the wind right now? Okay. Let me know. Yes. There is a question as old as time, heard around the world and in every heart. It thrills the imagination and gives wings to possibility. Its footsteps fill history and its hands hold destiny. It whispers in the dark and its echo shakes the earth. The question called to those who came before, and they answered with the incredible. It urged them to start song and think infinite, to pursue possibilities and dream no song dream, to see a future filled with hope and unite to build something better. Working together, they connected continents. Building the future of flight, they unlocked the stars. Leading their generation, they inspired ours. To dream high and fly far. To bind together and build the future. To lead our world and find new ones to honor their legacy and leave our own. Our founders heard the call, and their answer lives on. From ocean waves to the edge of space, through our first century and into the next. Their memory remains. Now, it's our turn. The question is calling louder than ever. What will we dream next? Yes! Grown men cry when they see that video. Amazing. Now look, what will we do next? Inspiring question, but doesn't give you the details, right? To flesh that out, let's talk about two questions. Now these are the ones that I want you to think about, right? But I want you to spend that 45 seconds of rich time 
in between this and Instagram, okay, to really let it sink in. Question number one. Huh. Are our dreams big enough? Are our dreams big enough? Are your dreams big enough? Now, notice what this doesn't say. Are our objectives big enough? Are our plans big enough? Are our goals big enough? Are our projections large enough? What does it say? It says, are our dreams big enough? Because when you ask somebody what are your goals, or you ask somebody what are your objectives, you ask somebody what are your plans, they say, well, you know, I'm going to try to carve out a good life for myself, provide for my family, and hopefully not get arrested and that sort of thing. I mean, it's, the bar is low, right? But you ask somebody what are your dreams, and they get a glint in their eye, right? And they lean back in their chair, and they think much bigger, okay? So we use the word dreams very deliberately, and of course, you know, it's got a great brand tie in for us too, as you can see there, but, but, it, but, but, but I encourage each of you to lean back in your chair and ask yourself, what are you dreaming of, okay? And is it big enough? All right. I used to use a joke that says, nobody dreams of selling insurance. <laughs> you dream of selling, am I right? Nobody dreams of selling insurance. And then the guy from whom I bought insurance, a guy named Paul Foster, who was point guard for Furman, and you're behind me, he sold insurance to every young executive in the entire upstate of South Carolina and got fantastically rich. And he built himself a 12,000 square foot uh, uh, mansion in Greenville that had its own full-size basketball court. And he says, how do you like me now selling insurance? Right? <laughs> okay, fine, get it. I'm not, I'm not, not prejudging any dream, but make sure it's a dream, okay? If anyone is sitting here thinking, ah, you know, I'll carve out a nice life. Man, that is too bad. Let me give you another illustration. I was meeting with my financial advisor. Somebody mentioned they're into wealth management, which is a cool thing. I was meeting with my financial advisor the other day, and he said, ah, you know, David, you've had a good run so far. You put together a nice nest day. You know, let's talk about your strategies. And I said, okay, that's great. You know, and he said, so what's your risk tolerance? And I said, uh, well, uh, you know, moderate. <laughs> you know, a little bit of risk. I want it to grow, but I don't want to lose it all and all that stuff. And he said, all right, scale of one to 10. I said, five. He said, man, that is sad, right? Because he said, David, you're 40 years old. Give me a break. You've got forever, right? It should be, scale of 1 to 10, it should be a 12. Risk it now because you've got time. And you all have a lot more time than I have, okay? So you have the room to dream big, not to dream small. What happens when you dream big? Well, it opens your perspective a little bit. You know, you stop thinking, well, golly, maybe I could run a dry cleaners to maybe I could run a publicly traded dry cleaning franchise, you know, empire, right, et cetera. Um, all right, it also does this. It says, ah, I've got this dream, but I can't get there. I'm not equipped to get there, right? I've got limitations, okay? So ask yourself this second question. Are our limitations in fact, advantages. That reason that you say you can't achieve your goal, could that actually be an advantage? Let me give you this illustration. Who can name those two people pictured on that magazine? And don't look at the fine print cheating. Come on, y'all. Anybody? Any law fans in here? The guy on the left, at our left, is Ted Olson with the blonde hair. Uh, he represented Bush in Bush versus Gore in 2000. Y'all know Bush and Gore, right? That's a big election. Yeah, yeah. Um, the guy on the right is David Boies, B-O-I-E-S. He represented Gore in the Bush versus Gore case. They recently united to team up to take down, um, well, to, to, to argue in the Supreme Court for marriage equality, right? And think what you will, some people love that case, some people hate it, but it was a majestic victory for these two guys who took that case. That was a big win for them, all right? David Boies is one of the most famous lawyers in the United States, all right? He's got a firm called Boies Schiller. It's got about 1,200 lawyers. It's, I think, recently the most profitable law firm. They're making about seven million bucks a partner. It's a big deal. He's awesome. He's represented the Yankees and uh, various other, Viacom, I mean, CBS. David Boies is dyslexic, severely dyslexic, all right? When David Boies was a kid, he couldn't read until he was in like fourth grade or something like that. 
severely dyslexic. So they said, David, you know, how in the world did you overcome that? And he said, well, I got really good at memorizing stuff, okay? And when David Boies was standing in front of the Supreme Court representing Al Gore in that election, Justice O'Connor asked him a question and said, you know, what do you think about this particular principle of law? And he said, you know, Madam Justice, the place to look for that is page 238 of the Southern Reporter, right? That'll answer your question. And observers said, how in the world did he, did he memorize all of that stuff? And, and he was asked later about it. And he said, you know, I did get really good at memorizing things, but I also learned to identify what was important and focus on that, memorize that stuff, and cull out all the noise, okay? If you had turned to David Boyce when he was in fourth grade, right, or eighth grade, or uh, I don't know, a freshman in college, and said, hey, you're going to be the greatest lawyer in the world, he's going to say, no, I'm dyslexic. But it turned out that was to his advantage, all right? Really cool example. Now, Ted Olson is colorblind. As you can see from his sort of aggressively blue um, jacket, I had lunch with Ted. He was recruiting me when I got out of the Department of Justice. And he showed up, and I swear it must have been a purple jacket. And man, it cost more than like my life savings at the time. He's colorblind. That doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I don't think he had to overcome anything. I just think it's interesting. He had a limitation, too. Look at that suit. Man. <laughs> so, um, so ask yourself, whatever is telling you that you can't succeed in that dream, could that, in fact, be an advantage? Let's talk about Boeing, South Carolina. When the Boeing company decided to build the 787 outside of the Puget Sound region of Washington State, Everybody said it can't be done. Because up until that point, wide body airplanes, and those are the ones that have two aisles, right? Narrow body airplanes have one aisle, the puddle jumpers. Wide body airplanes up to that point had only been built in two places in the entire world. Seattle, Washington, where, where, where uh, Boeing is located, and Toulouse, France, where Airbus is located, the A word, right? Two places in history. So the board of directors said, you know what? You know, we're having issues you know, up there. We need to, to geographically diversify. We're going to find somewhere else to do it. So they announced that to the world. We're going to hold a competition and find a new location to build these airplanes. And everybody said, I mean, they, they were fainting in the streets. It can't be done, right? The people in Seattle felt that it was sort of a, a her, hereditarily passed on trait to be able to build airplanes. We're the only ones the, of the human population that can build these things, right? So it was a big deal when Boeing decided to take a risk and go somewhere else at all. And then when they decided to go to Charleston, South Carolina, which is geographically the furthest possible place from Seattle that you can get, people were truly fainting in the streets. Those people don't know aerospace at all. They have no experience. There's a great line in the Seattle Times where a, uh, a mechanic in Seattle was quoted as saying, South Carolina, they're all farmers down there. This was like 2009, you know, <laughs> it's a couple of years ago. They, could, they didn't think we could do it, right? Because we didn't have that history. We didn't have 100 years of history. All that stuff you saw in the video hadn't happened here, right? But it turned out not having that history, that, that perceived disadvantage, was a miraculous advantage for us here. Because everything that we did here, we took a fresh look, right? People weren't burdened with the assumptions that their dad or their mom or their uncle had taught them, right? This is the only way that you can build a plane, you know, with a unionized workforce and certain schedules and certain supplier structure and all that stuff. It was a clean sheet down here in Charleston. And after a couple of years, guess what? The Charles, our team in Charleston was building these airplanes faster and at higher quality than the folks in Puget Sound. Ha! Amazing, what a story. They've since caught up and we have an amazing integrated team. I say that because I'm being recorded. <laughs> But, but, uh, but man, we did it, right? And we did it because that perceived disadvantage became our advantage, right? Enabled us to take that fresh look. So when you guys lean back in your chair and you think, golly, I can't do it because X, ask yourself, could X be an advantage for me? Now look, if you're five foot two and you say my dream, right, is to be the center for Duke basketball, right, or the center for the Pistons or whatever, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Congratulations, you have identified a true limitation. But be skeptical of your assumed limitations. Be skeptical of them. Test them in your mind. Because they could, in fact, become an advantage, just like ours did. Now, are you dreaming big enough? When we built this airplane, we uh, tried to dream very big, right? Fitting uh, the name. 
What we tried to do is to fix everything that airlines and passengers hate about flying. We tried to fix all of that stuff in one airplane. All right, and here's how we did it. We made the airplane more productive, so more profitable, right, for our customers, the airlines. We made it more comfortable, funner to fly for passengers, and we made it more efficient and quiet for everybody that surrounds this ecosystem, right? Those were our objectives. And this was uh, 2003, 2004. Those are big dreams, right? We didn't just say, ah, let's make it a little bit more productive. Or let's you know, try to tweak that you know, 767 a little bit because we already have a good thing here. No, we, we tried to really throw the sheet out and start fresh, right? Big dreams. And here's how we did it for the airlines. I won't read this to you, but basically both sides of the ledger were dramatically improved, right? So it was more profitable and cheaper to fly. Okay, that's what we did for the airlines. I won't bore you with how, you can kind of see it there. And then for the customers, we improved the customer experience, the passenger experience so dramatically. And I wanna show you a couple of pictures here. You guys have all flown on planes. Imagine if you walked onto an airplane and it looked like that, right? Oh my gosh, this is not the claustrophobic sort of tunnel that you're used to, right? This is a bright, open, tall, looks like you're walking into a Kiowa house, right? So what specifically did we do for the customers? We said, everything you hate about flying, we're gonna fix, okay? Big dreams, all right? What, one of the things that you all hate about flying, I assume, is that claustrophobic feeling, right? It feels like you're walking into a 1970s classroom when you get onto this like sort of beige-colored, closed-in airplane, right? Does that ring a bell with anybody? Yeah. So what our engineers uh, concluded is if you make the ceiling of the airplane a particular color of blue, it feels infinite. It feels infinite for, for a passenger. We call it sky blue, right? Not, not the most creative name, but it, it fits, right? So that takes away that upward claustrophobic feeling, all right? Number one, what else do you hate about flying, right? How about when you're deplaning and you have to stand like this well, for about 15 minutes while you wait for the rows in front of you to deplane, right? Well, let me go back one. Notice how these stow bins are shaped, right? They kind of go upward like that, so that the people that are standing up can actually stand fully upright. Very cool thing, but bad if you can't fit you know, roller bags in them or something like that. So our engineers figured out a way to fit, what is that, five, four or five roller bags in these upwardly shaped um, stow bins, okay? Solving both of those problems. And those stow bins are made in Ladson, South Carolina, just up the road uh, from here. Now, the other thing that you hate about flying, if I'm channeling you correctly, is when the guy who's on the window seat does what? Lowers that plastic shade, right? And suddenly you're in that 1970s beige classroom again, okay? So what we did here is, check out the gentleman on the left of that picture. You see the little button next to his uh, arm there? Rather than having a pull down shade, that button shades um, or, or tints, I guess, the window, right? And then untints the window. So you can still see out of the window, but whatever you know, prompted him to pull that thing down in the first place, right, is also addressed. So it kind of tints the window right there. So again, that gets rid of that claustrophobic feeling. Now, <laughs> when we first launched the plane, they were pushing the button and it wasn't getting dark enough. And the people who were in Japan, who were our launch customers, got really upset. They said, it's not dark enough. Where's the shade? So we had to darken it up. But, but very cool thing, right? How do we do all of this? The biggest innovation of this 787 is the fact that it is primarily made out of composite, out of plastic, as opposed to aluminum. All the airplanes up to this point, passenger airplanes, were made out of aluminum. So if you take a forklift, right, this may have happened. <laughs> if you take a forklift and you accidentally run it into an aluminum airplane, what, what happens? You dent the devil out of that airplane, right? For a composite airplane made out of plastic, if you take a forklift and run it into that airplane, the forklift loses, all right? The airplane wins. That is a cool thing. So this composite is, is very, very durable. It's also moldable. So if you try to, to, to uh, bend aluminum very sharply, what happens to the aluminum? It breaks, yeah, right. Eventually you hit a failure point, right? So that limits the degrees that the engineers can incorporate into the design. They can't make that sharp of a corner because otherwise it'll fail, right? But because this composite is molded, right, into that shape, as opposed to bent. This opened up unbelievable design opportunities for our engineers. So they could make sharper corners and make the wings that kind of funny 
aerodynamic shape. It opened up that possibility for them. Very cool. Now, what's another thing that you hate about flying? Jet lag, right? Long flight, you feel parched. You feel like you've been working all day and all you've been doing is watching Chopped, right? <laughs> yeah, amazing. That's because in an aluminum airplane, you have to keep the humidity very low, right? Because metal components have a tendency to what in, mo in moist environments? Rust, right? Just like my boat up in Daniel Island, rusty. Well, if you have a plastic airplane, not, a, uh, not, a, not an aluminum airplane, it doesn't rust. So that enables the airline to jack up the humidity inside, and you feel awesome when you get off of your transatlantic flight. I was once flying from Washington, D.C. to um, Tokyo on a 777, so a 777, a big, nice aluminum airplane. And I asked, I was so excited, I asked the, the flight attendant, it was ANA, which is our launch customer for the 787, that was the airline. I said, what do you think about the 787? And she said, I love it. And here's why. I said, well, I, said, I, I prompted her, I said, what about the moisture and all that stuff? She said, let me give you this example. On this plane, if I take this washcloth and set it on this counter, by the end of the flight, it will be bone dry and stiff. But on a 787, the same scenario, it would still be moist 12 hours later. That's a palpable difference that you all can feel, and it's made possible by this composite structure. There's the family. We have three variants of the 787. The, the headline about this chart is that bottom, 787-10. Uh, uh, that is built exclusively in South Carolina. Now, why, right? Well, we, uh, we have that dream lifter, which you all saw you know, er earlier on, on these, uh, uh, in this deck. Some say that that 787-10 couldn't fit on the Dreamlifter, and that's the reason that we build it here in South Carolina exclusively. Others say that we are so good in South Carolina that the company vested the, uh, vested the work of building this exclusively in South Carolina to capture that benefit, right? The truth shall remain with the lawyers. A very controversial slide here, right? And one that will interest you if you're in the area of logistics or you have aspirations uh, to that end. When we launched this plane, we made the decision to outsource the manufacturing of most of the parts. And you can see this is sort of an exploded view of the 787, and it lists the people who make the different components and where they're located. The upshot being the 787's parts are made by companies around the world, right? And they have to make them with such precision that when those are brought together, they fit perfectly, because this is an airplane and it flies at 40,000 feet. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever ordered, you know, like a desk from Target or from, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the Scandinavian company? Ikea. Ikea, right, college students, I love it. Um, when you ordered your desk from Ikea and you're putting that thing together and it's got the little things, you know, and you get to the very last piece and it, you gotta really get behind it, right? And get it into place, right? That can't happen with an airplane. <laughs> you can't be wrenching that last piece into place. It has to fit with you know, the certainty of you know, one thousandth of an inch. I'll just make something up. Um, so you can imagine when you outsource the design and manufacture of all of these parts, it becomes a challenge because all of these folks have to work together. Many of them are competitors. Some of them are our competitors. right? So when we made the decision to do that, it was very controversial. And what it led to was delays in the program. The things didn't quite fit together. Right, to use a simplified analogy. So we were going to launch this program in 2008, but instead we decided, eh, that's not going to work, we need to push it back. So we told all our airline customers it'll be a six-month delay. We'd sold like a thousand of these by that point. We told them it'll be six months later. And then that six-month came, and we said it's going to be another six months. And then that six-month came, and we said it's going to be another six months. And then that six-month came, and we said it's going to be another six months. And that stutter step continued for three years. Devastating. Imagine if like you ordered, I don't know, what does one order these days? Food, <laughs> like a pizza. And they said, it'll be here in a half an hour. And then they call and they said, it'll be another 15 minutes and another 15 minutes. Like it's bad enough if they call you and say it's gonna be two hours, right? Cause then you can plan and, but if they edge you out like that, well that's what we did to our customers. But this airplane was such a game changer that no customer sued us as a result of that, all right? It shows you the value proposition of the 787, that even though we did that to our customers, they stuck around, and, and now this airplane has been fantastically successful for them. So, South Carolina, we've got about five minutes left, and then we'll take your questions. Um, 
again, the decision to open uh, in South Carolina was a very controversial decision, but it has become a success story in American industry. Um, we have knocked it out of the park here. You have knocked it out of the park here. This community uh, has supported us. So I want to play you a video which walks you through building a 787-10, and then we'll take it home. <coughs> Everything that you see here is done nine miles up the road from you. Sound. Yes. Nice. We tell you, you want to see grown men and women cry again, bring them to the first flight of an airplane that they built in the Athens, Maine. So that happens nine miles up the road at Bowen, South Carolina. I'll buzz through the rest of these slides to make sure we have a couple of minutes for questions. But very briefly, uh, oh, and by the way, I do want to put this in. I hope that at least one of you in this room leaned back in her or his chair and said, it looked like they manually painted that airplane. We've sent people to the moon and we're still putting stencils up and painting airplanes that way. You're right. I hope you lean back in your chair and say, I'm going to figure out a way to do that better. Because you can, right? I can. My time's passed. So what did uh, uh, South Carolina do for Boeing to bring us here? Everything. Uh, the most amazing commitment uh, and supportive atmosphere to uh, convince Boeing to partner uh, and, and come here. And if you look closely at that picture, you'll see your former president, Glenn McConnell, and a number of uh, other elected leaders. Uh, and then in the center there was Marco Cavazzoni, who spoke here a few years back. Great guy. Um, South Carolina really um, changed the game when it came to uh, creating a supportive atmosphere uh, for Boeing. You know, we weren't used to that, right? I mean, the, we've been in the Puget Sound for 100 years. We've got a wonderful partnership with them as well. But we're not new there. We were new here. And South Carolina said, we're going to step up to the plate and do it. So uh, tremendous incentives that were tied to very significant commitments by Boeing to invest billions and create thousands of jobs here. The workforce training program that the state provided literally trained you know, 
six or 7,000 people uh, for free uh, because the state made that commitment. They said, we are going to present you with trained workers if you come here, right? And then, of course, a supportive business environment. It's wonderful to have government want you to be here. It, it is phenomenal. And I will say, you know, I was in the room uh, across the table from, from Glenn McConnell and Speaker Harrell and, and uh, uh, Senator Leatherman when we did the negotiation of, of uh, our big expansion in 2013. And, and they're very jovial in public, but boy, when it comes time to fight for the state of South Carolina and fight for the people and, and, and get the best deal that the state can get, they fight hard. Um, in fact, I'll never forget it. It was on Good Friday of 2013 uh, that we had this negotiation, uh, one of them anyway, and, uh, and, it, was, and it was tough. And they were tough. And they extracted very significant commitments from Boeing uh, in terms of job creation and investment. So, so you can be very proud uh, of your elected leaders for, for getting a good deal for the state. And the fact that they did it on Good Friday, I thought was pretty impressive uh, as well. My wife didn't like that, but it happens. Now, we've held up our side of the bargain too, right? We've created thousands of jobs. We've invested about $2.5 billion uh, here. Uh, we have laid the, the groundwork for other companies to come here. Volvo is a great example. I mean, their guys flew over from Sweden. I took them on a tour of our facility, told them the same story I'm telling you guys right now. They were impressed. Obviously, the tour alone didn't lure them here, although I'd love to claim credit, but, but the fact that Boeing made this decision really laid the groundwork. Torre is one of our big suppliers. They make that carbon fiber that you saw them wrapping the uh, molds at the beginning. They're, they're up in Spartanburg. They have a billion dollar investment, 500 jobs. So a lot of side benefits in addition to the direct workforce that Boeing has brought. You can see in 2009, we had 2,000 people. Now we've got about 7,000 people on site. One of the biggest issues for the lawyers is where are they all gonna park? <laughs> so I've spent a lot of my time doing leases to figure out parking spaces and that sort of thing. You can see how our facilities have gone from 900,000 square feet to 4 million square feet. Our investment numbers, our acreage, just soaring growth. A very diverse uh, site. All that stuff is happening uh, on our site. This is a cool thing. This is an overview. This is what our site looked like before we came here. That was a former phosphate mine. The condition of the soil was like chocolate pudding. Okay, here's some pictures of it. Look at that. You see how it has kind of a corduroy effect? That's the product of phosphate mining 100 years earlier. And that had to be dug out if you look at the kind of top left of the picture there, you see how they're starting to dig that out where it goes sort of light brown? That had to be dug out about six feet down in order to be usable again. I'll show you this photo here. Look at that muck, right? That's why that site lay dormant for about 100 years, because nobody could make the investment, could make the business case work to come here, because they had to do that, right? But Boeing sells its planes for about $200 million a piece, right? So lo and behold, the business case worked for us. We wanted to be next to the airport, and we made it happen. Very cool story. So here's the site today. You saw the overhead before. Here are the different phases of what we've put in. It's just a tremendous success story. We have a north campus up in Ladson. And now look at this, right? That is the yellow is the existing site, which is about 250 acres. A couple years ago, we did this. We bought this. Imagine the potential for growth that that extra land, some 465 acres, makes available. And also, it's, that's the airport in the top left there. It looks tiny compared to the scope of the site. Very cool. We do it all with zero waste to landfill. Nothing gets thrown away. In fact, one time I showed up in 2013 and somebody was all aghast because they found like a disposal bin of Boeings in the landfill. So they thought, you know, it was going to, you know, it was going to, ruin our, our commitment. And they said, what do we do about it? You know, what's the legal answer? And I said, well, fish it out of the landfill, right? So they fished it out, and we're still zero waste to landfill. Very neat. Uh, big commitment to the community, big numbers. Um, you can imagine that. And I'm going to leave on this. So Triona Prelo, this is the impact of a company like Boeing, bringing them here. And you want to talk about dreaming big, right? Triona Prelo was the valedictorian at North Charleston uh, High School a couple of years back. That's a fairly economically disadvantaged high school that's immediately adjacent to Boeing. She started in high school. She was a freshman the same year that Boeing broke ground, all right? So as we built our site, she progressed through high school. She graduated valedictorian of her class and was interviewed by the Post and Courier. You all have seen these, these highlights that they do. You shoot, you're probably one of them, right? Written up in the paper. And they said, Triona, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said this. This is a direct cut and paste out of the paper. College plans. She's going to the University of California, Riverside to major in mechanical engineering. Are you kidding me? Her mom and dad, who are fantastic people, right? One, uh, Mary, is a tri-county link driver, and her dad, a truck driver, and she's got four siblings. 
right? She watched Boeing grow up and, and got into Riverside, majored in mechanical engineering, and they said, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to work for Boeing, focusing on one specific part of a plane to help it run more efficiently. Boeing didn't exist when she entered high school. And now that she's leaving, that's what she wants to be when she grows up. You can't measure intangible impacts like that. But that's an impact, right? I want to talk about big dreams. That's pretty cool. So are your dreams big enough, right? And are your perceived limitations, in fact, advantages. I hope you'll lean back in your chair and, and, and ask yourself that and then get after it, right? Because you guys, the possibilities are endless. They're starting to end for guys like me. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Specifically. Yeah, great question. So I'm the senior counsel for Boeing South Carolina. Any legal issue that impacts the site falls into my portfolio. We have a team of three lawyers and two paralegals, and we handle it all. Interestingly, we are the, the only geographically defined law department in the Boeing company. Everybody else is subject matter defined. I should be looking at you, you ask the question. Um, so there's a patent lawyer, right? And there's a litigator, and there's an environmental lawyer, right? And we are the South Carolina lawyers. All right. Now, earlier in my career, I had uh, uh, responsibilities for litigation and international stuff, but, but that's what we do here. Uh, it's a hyper-localized thing. Cool? One second. Yes? OK, um, so I remember when you were talking about limitations and how you use those for advantage. You mentioned Ted Olson. Yeah. I was wondering, you are whatever you are for Boeing. So what limitations did you have? That's what my wife says. Whatever you are, right. <laughs> Just make sure the check comes every two weeks, right? Yeah, okay. What limitations did you have that you used to advantage to get aware of? Man, it's a, it's a great question. A lot of times it's been, it's been my youth. Um, I, I came straight through college and law school. Uh, a lot of people take a break in between. And I've been in a lot of situations where it's like me and like a 58-year-old, you know, negotiating. And a lot of times they take me for granted, okay? They'll find out. In fact, I got an email the other night from this just plaintiff's lawyer. Makes me so mad. He said, you're one to scold me. You're 15 years younger than me. Well, he's got a couple, let me tell you. Uh, so, so, so that's been something that, that, I've, that I've, you know, you can perceive that as an advantage. You're sort of green behind the years. But you know what? People don't see you coming. Is that a fair answer? Yeah. Sir. Generally speaking, um, what do you look for, like credential-wise, in students coming out of college, like for your potential hires? Yeah, everybody, listen to this, man. If you want to succeed, if you want to get hired, and then equally important, advance, right? You have got to own you. All right. No one is going to succeed for you. All right. You got to lean back in your chair and say, "What is my dream? What do I want to be in my life?" And then go after it. Okay? I got this job at Boeing because I was sitting at my desk in my firm in Greenville and I said, there's got to be a better way. I didn't wait for some recruiter to call me. I wrote Boeing. And I said, hey, you guys may not be interested. You haven't advertised for a job, but I think I would fit really well down in Charleston. And seven years ago, they said, we agree. All right? Nobody reached out and succeeded for me. Okay? And man, when you get into a company, all right, if you're one of those go-getters that actually wants to get after it and succeed, you're going to be one of few. Okay, and, and, and again, not to generalize, but I mean, the younger generation sort of waits for others to sort of decide for them. No, decide for yourself. All right, that's a really generalized answer, but man, you'll be one of few if you do that. So to caveat off that, do you have any contact information that we could have for like a recruitment office? <laughs> I don't know. Not too forward, but. Have you, uh, have you, have you, have you graduated law school yet? <laughs> That'd be my, yeah, look, just in all seriousness, if the answer, if the question is serious, Careers at Boeing, uh, uh, we've got a fabulous website. Just peruse it. Learn the possibilities, right? You, you may think you've got to be a mechanical engineer to come and, and work at Boeing, but you don't. You could be a poli-sci major, right? Uh, I will say that data analytics is the future. Uh, so if, if any of you data scientists in here are thinking about pursuing that, man, 
If you say that, you'll get, you'll get as I told these guys, you'll get hired before you cross the street. Careers at Boeing. At Boeing. Yeah. Best ways to get experience for a job at Boeing. Like, what would look good on a resume? Great question. Um, Besides just saying you graduated. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that helps. That helps. <laughs> First steps. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll give you the stock answer, which is we got a great internship program, and you got to apply like now. I, a lot of people come in the spring and they say, "Hey, I'd like to get an internship." Well, the deadline's like tomorrow or something. So I mean, look, look that up if you're interested in a fabulous internship. I think we hire like 70 interns up there, a lot from here. Um, uh, but, but, but again, I, what's the best way to get experience? Let me tell you, man, you're going to have your whole life to try to follow the rules and, and, uh, and do what is expected. Um, you're going to eventually have a spouse and maybe kids and certainly a mortgage. Maybe. Um, although you probably won't have a car because Uber will be, you know, prevalent, but um, you know, you've got a whole life to follow those rules. Spend, you know, age 22 to 26 kind of breaking the rules, right? Um, trying to get maybe an internship in something that sounds cool. Um, and I say sounds cool because it, it is cool. You know, somebody encouraged me one time, try to get an internship with Linda Greenhouse of the New York Times. She's the Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times. I was a firm at the time. I said, please. So I got an internship at some law firm in Atlanta. I followed the rules. I didn't break the mold. Man, A, working for Linda Greenhouse would have been a fabulous experience. But B, man, I mean, it would have looked good on my resume because I would have stood out. I'd say break the rules a little bit. Yes, sir? Have you ever faced any lawsuits at Boeing? Have I personally? Or uh, like just the, the company? Yes, the company has been sued. Yes, yes, and thank goodness for that. Right? <laughs> yeah, man, we get we get sued sometimes. Uh, interestingly, we're, you know, we're a ninety-three billion dollar company. Um, we don't get sued that often, and the reason is the people who would typically sue us, uh, supply, I think suppliers, customers. You know, when there are only two people in the world that make airplanes, you're kind of in bed together. You know, so. You know, you could sue and like get a hundred million dollar judgment against us, and we'd be like, okay, well, we're not going to work with you anymore, right? Or you could customer and sue us and get all kinds of money from us, and we're like, well, it's either us or Airbus, <laughs> you know? So, so I say that in jest, but but in all truth, I mean, we don't generate that much litigation. Now, when we do, the cases are usually large, the issues are usually complex, um, but you know, a supplier will have a systemic issue, and sometimes we'll fight about it and who should pay who, and and and, and occasionally. It'll be a court, you know, and that's why I exist. Others. Yeah. 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 Yeah.